This is part two of my Ukrainian history series, where together with my friend Andriy Masluk, we hope to give you a glimpse of Ukrainian history, told from a Ukrainian perspective. Today we will be going over the later periods of the Principality of Ruthenia, onward to the times of the Cossacks. Moving a little forward in history uh, to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Yes. I feel uh, a lot of people don't study this time in history. They don't yes. know this time of history. Uh, nor do they know the fact that uh, Belarus and Ukraine were both included in this. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a fascinating period. It's the time of history when Lithuania was the greatest European superpower. Imagine, it's like the parallel universe, but, it, but not only Lithuania was a prominent country, it was a superpower in modern terms. Lithuanians, uh, together with Ukrainians and Belarusians, they were able to defeat the great Mongol Empire. So uh, that's th this is this this changed everything. This changed the the course of history because the south of Ukraine before that was under direct control of the Mongols. This is steppe lands. They were very easily accessed by the uh, nomads. Yeah. But uh, Lithuanian rulers, uh, I, I, they were able to defeat the Mongols and, and they had access to the Black Sea. So during the ruling of uh, Grand Duke Vitautas, uh, the city, I think the city of Odessa was was kind of settled and other parts of southern Ukraine. And you know, you can, you can find it in Russian propaganda like all the time. Oh, Odessa was found in 18th century by Catherine the Great. But actually, people lived there since the time, since the since 1400s, basically. So it's like a couple century of difference, not a big deal. Right. So actually, why Lithuania became uh, so important? Because Lithuanians were used to uh, fighting against uh, the Western Crusaders, against Teutonic Order, and uh, they had this military tradition, but they lacked military technology. So that's why they um, united with uh, lands which is now parts of Ukraine and Belarus and basically the boyars from Ukraine they fought in the same manner as European knights and that's that, that's what gave Lithuanian the edge against the western uh, basically kind of enemies you can say but also Lithuanians uh, they helped the locals, people from Kyiv, people from Belarus, to defend themselves against Mongols, and they were so powerful that even the modern, you know, the shore of Black Sea was under control, under the, in, uh, the interest of Lithuanian kingdom. So that's why, that's why Lithuanian period is so fascinating. So imagine the small country of Lithuania today, they used to be a superpower were defeating the Mongol Empire. But they did it not by themselves, but as a part of a group, which is even more fascinating. They united all those kingdoms, all those people together. And they were able to do this because they, they had um, like relay family relationships with our dynasty. Because, for example, King Danilo uh, would marry daughter of Mindaugas, so the first king of Lithuania. So just like Danilo was the first king of Ruthenia, well, there is Izaslav, so it's, I will not go into detail, <laughs> but let's say Danilo was the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Mindaugas was the first king of Lithuania, and they, they, they were allies, they became, became allies, and uh, then uh, Danilo married daughter of uh, Mindaugas. So one of this Danilo sons, his name was Švarnas, so it's, I think, Lithuanian name. So he became a Grand uh, Duke of Lithuania for a short period of time, but uh, during his uh, uh, rule, actually, it, it all happened that Lithuania united 
lands which were part of Kiev and Rus and became this larger uh, entity, larger polity, and, and later they were able to defeat Mongols. So it was all because this wise policy of King Danilo, by, they united with Lithuania and later Lithuania became the core around which the Ruthenian or Rus lands would unite. Uh, it was something that a, uh, uh, a, a Polish friend actually pointed out. Putin didn't mention it at all. Yes. He, no narrative about that ever came up or that Ukraine was at one point part of what another, it was another union of European kingdoms. Yes. Do you think that was intentional? Oh, I think, I think uh, they, do, they even don't study this period I in Russia because it's so inconvenient to their narrative, you know. They could just mention it um, like briefly or they mention it as a Polish occupation. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative they are pushing. So actually, I read old um, Ukrainian or Soviet history books and everywhere you see this idea oh, the, the Polish landlords they would uh, basically exploit the peasants and but what about Ukrainian elite you know what about the, um, the people who are like princes and like dukes counts you know the all the elite oh but they have another narrative they all betrayed their own people they all polonized they start speaking Polish, so they were not, not more, no more, you know, uh, sympathetic to their people, which is a very interesting narrative. It's 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 a mold of Russian imperial narrative and like a Soviet narrative. They kind of somehow they combine those two <laughs> together. So uh, the problem is that. There are many uh, European kingdoms that are like this. For example, uh, the kingdom of England and Wales, which united two kingdoms later, Scotland also became part uh, of this kingdom, and that's how United Kingdom appeared. And there was another uh, kingdoms like this, like the you have kingdom of Charlemagne, you know, when uh, bigger parts of Europe, which is now France, Germany, and Italy, they were part of greater kingdom. And it was normal that kingdom could be made of different countries and even different cultures. But the idea is that just the ruler of the country is, is separately. For example, in the, uh, this time we are talking about Ukraine, so there was a kingdom called Rzecz Pospolita in, Poli in Polish, which just means republic. If you translate Rzecz Pospolita, it just means republic. Imagine kingdom that is also called republic. So, uh, so the, king, uh, the king of this uh, country was king of Poland, then he was king of Ruthenia or Ukraine separately, and then he was Grand Duke of Lithuania. So those were separate titles. It just happened that one person had all three titles. But we can have moments when two people have different titles. For example, sometimes there was conflict between King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania when those were two different people. But if it's one person, there is no conflict. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Also, there is uh, no one mentions Konstantin Ostrowski. He was just like uncrowned ruler of Ruthenia. He was the most powerful uh, князь or like ruler of, of, of this land. He created Ostroh uni University, the institution, and he basically uh, was treated as a European ruler. So it, it just happened that his land was part of a greater kingdom of uh, republic or rich pospolita. <laughs> so again, it, it's it's much more complicated than that. It's and and uh, the idea of elite betraying uh, anyone, you know, they were the rulers. This was was no, nothing to betray. You know, in 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 the medieval times and early modern times, the politics was the business of families. There was no nation as a political union. There were like in ethnographic language there were nations, so there were different cultures, different languages, tradition, but there was were no political nations. There were uh, political elites, the, 
they were, they were a nobility, the family of kings and princes, so they were the political elite. And they had more in common with foreign elites, like people from Germany, France, uh, than with their own people. That that's was the reality. <laughs> The Commonwealth period of Ukraine is a long and fraught period of history. It is true that Ukraine, or Ruthenia at the time, joined the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth through marriage. However, this relationship would sour over the years, especially in the borderlands regions known as the Wild Fields. While Andrei and I do not speak on it here, the Komelnitsky rebellions and the signing of the Pereyaslav Agreement are monumental moments in Ukrainian history. So much so I've actually written an entire essay on my substack about this time and how it links into the modern Russian narrative today. It is a great companion piece to this video, and while Andrei and I couldn't possibly talk about everything in Ukrainian history, I will run you through a little TLDR. In the mid-1600s, the Ukrainian Cossacks would rise up they would fight the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, if not for their complete independence, at least for a little bit more autonomy within the Commonwealth. This, of course, would be led by one Bodan Kamelnitsky. Kamelnitsky would face many threats. He would form many alliances. But after decades of fighting, it was clear that the Ukrainian states needed some sort of world power to intervene. And in their haste to find an ally, they ended up signing what is known as the Pereyaslav Agreement. This agreement, the Cossacks believed to be a military alliance between themselves and Muscovia, of what we call Russia today. The Russians saw this differently, though. They saw this as a chance to grab on to the old Kievan Rus lands. They saw this as an opportunity to own the Ukrainian people. And this would show Centuries of Ukrainian oppression would be brought to this agreement. This would be the header for what we see today in Ukraine. Indeed, even Trashevchenko, Ukraine's most notable poet, slammed Komolnitsky for even bringing Ukraine into the Russian sphere. The Russians, for their part, of course, would break this agreement constantly, sell off Ukrainian land, even back to the Poles, <laughs> the people they were supposed to protect them from. And eventually put the Ukrainians into serfdom. Of course, in the beginning, the Cossacks would be treated as more of a vassal state than anything. And indeed, one of the most important people of the 1700s in Ukraine was the hetman of this state, Ivan Mazepa. Mazepa is an incredibly interesting character, and I asked Andrei to speak a little about him. Oh, that's Mazepa, he's one of my uh, favorites because he fascinates not only Ukrainians, but there are many foreign writers that write about him. I think uh, even Lord Byron writes about Mazepa. There are like Polish poets write, writing about Mazepa, French writers. So uh, he was a very well known figure. He was one of the most famous uh, figures of his time. He was widely uh, a smart person. He was well, he was a scholar. He was well-learned person. There are many legends about him, like, you know, that he escaped from Poland, then he was tied to a horse, that's how he appeared in the Parisian siege, and, but uh, I think he was just a very skillful politician. Mm -hmm. And what's important is that Mazepa, he acted as an independent ruler, and why he's portrayed as a traitor, because in in Russian view, and it's not, it's not, it's like, uh, it's not correct in the sense that uh, it was this narrative was created later. They portrayed him as a uh, betrayer because he uh, ally was ally uh, became allies with Swedish king Charles the mm Twelfth. -hmm. But actually, Mazepa he acted as independent ruler, and he could have agreements with. with whoever he wanted. So uh, at the start of his rule, actually young uh, Russian Tsar Peter, now he known Peter the first, Peter the Great, he, he, he would be tutored by Mazepa. He would, Mazepa would be his advisor. But um, later, 
I think this relationship between those people, they were complicated. I think that maybe it was even like father and son because Peter was much younger, so probably Mazepa would tutor him. But later, he, the Pete, Peter wanted to conquer lands. He had like his big ambitions. So later, probably they, there were a clash between them or maybe someone didn't follow their promise, you know. So Mazepa decided that kingdom of Sweden should be the another diff, like uh, an ally uh, to him and uh, they united they were fighting together so Ukrainian Cossacks were fighting against the Russians the Moscovites with together with uh, the Swedes mm -hmm. so unfortunately for Ukraine uh, Russians were victorious back then but the problem is that not even so the most Cossacks they supported Russia not Mazepa and, and Sweden so that's one of the features of Ukrainian history that there were so many independently minded people you know and mm -hmm. and there were always people ready to change sides like but Mazepa since he was a ruler of, of Ukraine he would not change side he was just he would just act as independent ruler that's why you know he's port portrayed by russians as a traitor but this narrative was created later because just to justify uh, the russian rule over ukraine so he is very con co controversial figure but controversy is just from the russian side like for russian he for russians he is controversial but for ukrainians he is just you know very educated ruler and he actually left some very nice poetry about about how to rule the country so like like you can call it even political philosophy like uh, and one of his verses it's like uh, like this dear friends you should remember that not everyone can rule like look at a ship ship has only one captain and other people they follow him so just like this captain Mazepa wants to say well I'm your captain so you should just follow uh, follow my, um, my my advices because I'm, I'm more you know educated and so maybe it's a good idea to do that so he was a very very educated person but also um, what is interesting that after the defeat of Mazepa and Charles the 12th in the battle of Poltava it wasn't the end of 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 it you know mm -hmm. you know it's like in russian history all oh, like they defeated the swedes and finally it was a victory you know mm -hmm. but actually uh, so the swedes would retreat uh, to the lands of what is now moldavia and romania and there was another battle this time it was the Russian army crossed the river Prut and Dniester and they invaded the territory of modern Romania and they were fighting against the Ottomans, the Turks, but the Swedes and the Cossacks, they would fight together, you know, with the Turks and they would defeat Russians, they would defeat them so badly that um, Tsar Peter would barely escape with mm -hmm. his life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you never, he you hear about Battle of Poltava a, a, a lot, but do you hear about Battle of Prut a lot? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, it's like imagine the history of Napoleon without the battle of waterloo right. so so he would he would he would uh, con he would win many battles he would lose some he would lose in russia but then he would return mm -hmm. and that's it you know imagine story of napoleon without battle of waterloo but this is what we have about peter who's called peter the great so he defeated uh, uh, the swedes in one battle but then he lost another battle but he is uh, basically viewed as uh, this you know, we, he, victorious, right? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you know, Ukra Ukrainian Cossacks and Swedes were not able to capitalize on that battle of Prut and um, but still the Cossacks, which like Mazepa, even when Mazepa died, mm -hmm. like his followers 
continued uh, their uh, fight for the independence of Ukraine. For example, Polip uh, Orlik, he was his cancel, like chancellor of Mazepa, basically, like a prime, similar to prime minister, but like chancellor. So uh, he uh, created the first constitution in Europe. So it's another fascinating mm -hmm. fact. So actually Ukrainian Cossacks, not only they created a very democratic state, but also they created one of the first constitutions in Europe. So it's, it's debatable which one is first, but one of the first, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, a, a spring point to have yeah. a, a Bill of Rights, a constitution for people is yes. still an incredible thing to, yes. to have been able to make. Uh, a lot of people might not know uh, what a Cossack is, or oh. especially in the modern day. Is the, do you have a, like a brief explanation for people oh, who sure. might not know? Oh, sure. Let me, let me do just r r real brief explanation. So Cossacks were people who lived in borderlands, and that's why you have Russian Cossacks and Ukrainian Cossacks, but they are different in the sense that those are different people. So uh, Cossacks, they, um, you know, they often, uh, some, some of them, they were of Turkic origin, some of them were of Slavic origin, but the Ukrainian Cossacks, they were uh, all Orthodox Christians because it was a rule, you know, they would accept anyone, but they have to be to become Orthodox Christian. Also, Ukrainian Cossacks, they were very, uh, they were mainly, no, mainly known to being perfect sailors. They were, they were very good sailors and they fought as infantry, infantry. whether, for example, Russian Cossacks, they would uh, more, they would fight like cavalry. So, also Ukrainian Cossacks, they would create their own state which is important. And Russian Cossacks would fight many times against the Russian Tsar. There were the rebellion of uh, Yemelyan Pugachev, rebellion of Razin. So Russian Cossacks many times they challenged the Tsar of Russia, but never they were able to create their own state. Mm -hmm. So they lived on their land according to their rules. And after those rebellion of Russian Cossacks were crushed, all of the Russian Cossacks that left were very loyal to Russian Dars, mm -hmm. while Ukrainian Cossacks, they kept their independent spirit. And some Cossacks even had to leave Ukraine, but keep their independence. So, so for them, freedom was everything. So uh, after the siege, the main, like, uh, the capital of Cossacks was destroyed, mm -hmm. actually by treachery, by, it was during the rule of Catherine the Great, so the mm -hmm. Cossacks and Russian forces would fight against Turks, and on the way back, when, when there were almost no one in the capital of Siege, uh, it would be destroyed by Russian army. It's it's like it's like just typical backstab, you know. <laughs> uh, but the but the thing is, they just destroyed the the, the capital, the, the some buildings. The Cossacks they survived. They just moved uh, to the territory of Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and later Russians understood their mistake. They lost very capable fighters so they invited the cossacks that were uh, that 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 would listen to them they would invite them to the kuban river which is um, north in northern caucasus so um, in the kuban region of russia like those people who live there they are descendants of ukrainian cossacks mm -hmm. and that's why that that fight against a lot of, of Russian imperialism yes. from the Cossacks. It's why we see that identity being uh, almost reclaimed today a lot in Ukraine. Correct? Yes, uh, yes, exactly. So Cossacks were, uh, after the siege was destroyed, there were still people who were descendant of Cossacks because they just settled, became farmers. So, uh, and in many, so the, we have many songs against uh, about Cossacks and actually there is even a song about a Cossack who became a farmer and he's missing his comrades, his friends, he's inviting them for dinner to share their stories, to remember their past. 
So even even in the song, you see this connection. So the the Cossacks, they that's why Cossacks are part of Ukrainian identity. That's uh, because Cossacks never fully disappeared. They just mixed with with other people, but they kept their 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 songs, their memories, their stories, and those memories survived. Uh, actually, in the poems of Taras Shevchenko, which is like a very, very fascinating figure for Ukraine. Actually, modern Ukrainian language is based on the language of Taras Shevchenko, mm -hmm. because and many, many his poems are about Cossacks, where he missing the old good times where you when Ukraine was free, when uh, Cossacks was, would protect the land, would rule themselves, where there would be no czar, no emperor, just is far away, where, where, where this land belonged to us. That's why Shevchenko is still very much important and still very much um, kind of... Mm, uh, we remember his poetry because it's about 19th century, but it's also about today because he also says, you know, he's describing that, you know, we should fight against the Tsar uh, to reclaim our freedom. And we are still fighting for their freedom. Mm. So he, uh, in his poems, Ukraine finally will be free at some point. So that's why this poetry is so inspiring. It's still relevant to this day. Yes, and it's been a fight that's been going on for ages and ages for, for oh, yeah. Ukraine. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Like to, for Ukrainians, uh, like the history, like by reading history of Ukraine, it can be very discouraging because uh, in the very moment you think things gonna get better, they get worse. Yes. <laughs> so you probably know that Ukraine uh, had its independence in 1918. We had mm. this moment of independence after uh, the World War I when the Russian Empire collapsed and uh, Ukrainian uh, independent state was independently proclaimed in Kyiv and Lviv in two places. But later they merged together, they united and they fought against their enemies together. But the problem is that it, at that moment it seemed like all of the world was against us. So in the north we had Bolsheviks, so later they became Soviet Union. But for example in the west we had newly formed Polish Republic, which was also fighting against Ukrainians because they wanted Lviv, they wanted the west of Ukraine. And also, it's not all, because we had Hungarians that claimed Zakarpatia and Romanians, they wanted Bukovina and even French had their expedition in Odessa. So imagine if you are fighting for your independence, but it's almost like the whole world is against you. So the problem was that Ukrainian state early on had relationships with central powers, with Austria and Germany. But this is because Austria and Germany were the only countries that were uh, willing to recognize independent Ukraine. So it was this, you know, loop, you know, it was the only country that um, uh, was uh, able to recognize Ukraine. But later, since Ukraine was allies with Germany and Austria, uh, the uh, Entente, uh, so the British, the French, they looked down upon Ukrainians. So um, this, was, this is unfortunate to us and you know, that's why Ukraine was not able to gain its independence. But probably if Ukraine became independent, the Soviet Union might never be formed. Mm -hmm. Because Ukraine was so essential for Soviet Union by providing the grain, the manpower, the industrial base. So I think without Ukraine, Soviet Union would never be formed and there would be never a Cold War, like nuclear race. Imagine this parallel universe, like if, if British and French would just consider the idea that maybe people who uh, fought for their independence, uh, who proclaimed their independence, maybe they should be their own country, they should rule their own country. So mm -hmm. that would be a great. Probably, because mm -hmm. I think uh, because of uh, uh, Ukraine's strategic location, 
if uh, Russia controls Ukraine, it becomes an empire. But without Ukraine, Russia is just another state. That's why Russians are pushing so hard to conquer Ukraine, because they remember those times of you know, 18th century, 19th century, when Russia was in the, like, one of the top European powers, on the, on the peak of its power. But I think every country has peak of its power, and then, you know, something else happened so the history so remember british empire it was on peak of its power like before world war one so but again i think modern british people there they they seem to be happy for the most part they they just you know building their welfare state so i think russians should take clues from them should and maybe you know uh, because they have they have rich rich country rich with minerals with natural resources they could be the next canada but you know they are living uh, not regular people they are poor they are impoverished so yeah having so many resources but seeming to need something else it's it's like you said, Russia wants to almost become an empire again by yes. taking over Ukraine. Yes, I think. But if you look at the at the Russian narrative of history, it's like the Russia always was destined to become an, an empire. Mm -hmm. If you read about like Russian version about Kingdom of Moscow or like Duchy of Moscow, oh, it's like it's not conquering the land; it's gathering the land of Rus. You know, it's like those lands were lost and now we are reclaiming them. Those people, they don't want us, but we want them, we are reclaiming the land. Like, like look what happened with Novgorod. Novgorod was second Venice, but bigger, you know, more, it, it could have become, I don't know, like, actually, yeah, like second Venice, but look, do you, do you hear a lot about Novgorod now? No. <laughs> In Russia, so if some land with like province or country becomes part of Russia, you just almost everyone forgets about it because they drain so much resources uh, from, from it. And Russia is so centralized that everything is centralized in Moscow. Everything is, uh, every resource, every smart person, talented person, they have to be in Moscow or they are nobody, you know? my wife she's a teacher like english teacher so she used to follow some russian teachers before the war so there was this lady from uh, like small town in Russia and people would often ask her, but why are you not in Moscow? You know, you are losing your life here mm -hmm. in this small town. She said, no, no, I like my town, I want to, but, but for Russians it's an it's a alien concept, you know, you're either in Moscow or you are nobody. It's, to me, it's, it's, it's an alien concept. It's like, I don't know, I have to ask uh, you, you know, you have, uh, you in US, you have this beautiful city of New York. So do you think that you're either in New York or you're nobody, or you're either in Washington or nobody? Right, yeah. But in, in more countries, you can be in other cities or you're even your home city. And yeah. You still have that pride, you still have that that want to make it better. Yeah, exactly, you know, and, and I'm come from Lviv and I'm proud of my city, you know, yeah. I think my city is the best in my <laughs> opinion. It's, but, you know, it's almost the opposite in Russian. It's, it's like your city is terrible, but the Moscow, it's the, the best, you know, you have to live in Moscow, you are nobody. It's, for me, it's alien concept, but Russia was built from the start as a very centralized state probably moder modeled after the Mongols because they were a part of Mongol Empire and, and they were trying to recreate this um, empire and even if you look at the borders of Russia and then you kind of superimposed borders of Mongol Empire, you would <laughs> see some similarities. <laughs> there was a, 
uh, I think it was uh, one of the embassies of, of Russia put up a, a tweet that was showing a, a map of Russia that included yeah. a lot of Eastern Europe and everything else. And uh, the former Mongolian, I think it was prime minister, put up a photo of the Mongol Empire. And it's like, well, if we're going by this, you know, yeah. we, we technically own you guys then. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. The very, uh, yes, I should uh, thank you, this um, for ambassador from Mongolia. He had <laughs> sense of humor. If he will see us, I want to thank you. Sarah, you have quite a wit. Mm, yeah. <laughs>